Today on The Sound Test, I'm very honoured uh, to welcome Jonathan Wilson onto the show, um, also known as Robert De Negro, who many of you have surely heard on that excellent title track of Grand Theft Auto and many more tracks fr- uh, throughout the franchise. And uh, we're going to try and dig into um, pretty much all of them. So, John, welcome onto the show. Hey, it's good to be here. I'm surprised because... Such a long time ago. Man, it's a huge honour to have you here because um, I was about seven years old when Grand, Th- uh, Grand Theft Auto was released. <laughs> and um, I brought this up with Colin Anderson when I interviewed him, that I was far too young to be playing that game. But play it, I did. And it um, turned out to be one of my biggest influences, man. So it's a huge honour to have you here. It's a pleasure. Total pleasure. And uh, that title track was absolutely massive for me. And we're going to get into that and actually how that influenced me to get into hip hop from a young age. But before we even started with Grand Theft Auto, I thought we could dial back a little bit because reading this interview you've come out with recently, I came across the fact that Robert De Negro wasn't actually like a a Grand Theft Auto creation. It it had its birth before that. Yeah, it was me. So at the time, I was... I was finding my way in hip hop. So if you go back a little bit further, my first instrument is bass guitar and I was really into grunge and rock and like, you know, think about everything. Like I'm that old that I saw Nirvana play live, like when they were touring Smells Like Teen Spirit and Jane's Addiction, Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, Faith No More, Fishbone, like loads of cool bands. And then... Hip hop kind of took hold of me, and I don't know why. It's probably a, a mixture of things. Apart from hip hop music is amazing, uh, but also I guess because I was um, at uni in Scotland, and just at that time, there's not really much diversity in terms of ethnicity in Scotland. I was like, in the whole university, I could probably count on one hand how many black students there were. Literally, like there are thousands of students, and there's there's me and a couple of other people and so what i remember was going through my head that time as as a youngster was just wanting to find myself and express myself and then this thing hip-hop came out you know you've got cypress hill you've got wu-tang clan you've got dr dre you've got all sorts of things and they were talking about struggle and what it means to be like basically an ethnic minority even though you're a global majority so i was getting deep into hip-hop and to cut a long story short, um, it, it changed the music that I started to play as well. So I, uh, the rock band came to an end, which it was a cool band. I mean, I, I joined them as a, as a student because I picked up, you know, back in the days, you know, there was no social media. So I went into a guitar shop and there's like one of these recipe cards on a notice board that said, we're looking for a bass player. And I, I picked that card off the notice board and thought, okay, that's going to be my job. So literally, I think no one else could probably reply. And I, and I called him up and I was like, I, I'm your guy. And so I joined this band and they were called Two Damn Dread. And it was a bunch of Scottish guys from Dundee and Aberdeen. And it was kind of cool because they were like my first real gigs. And I remember the highlight of that band was supporting uh, a rock band from Glasgow called Gun. And I don't know if you know, but they had that song that just lit up MTV called Word Up. And so we, I, I play that in cover bands. All right, so like, so much. Oh man! So we supported them on, on one of their shows, and then I also ended up becoming like a roadie and then a sound engineer. So I saw Gun quite a few times and was like one of their kind of roadies on on some of their gigs. So I was really into rock, but then that band kind of came to an end, like most bands, you know. And and so when 
I had a blank piece of paper and I thought, what am I going to do? And I thought, I want to do kind of hip hop, like rock rap. I want to do something that brings all of my interests together. Uh, and then, of course, if you're going to do hip hop, you need rappers, right? <laughs> so <laughs> what happened was I was looking for people, but there was there weren't really any people around. I mean, later on, like our, our main MC called Eric T was, I, I went back to Manchester and, and convinced him to join us. And he's, he's like a seller MC. You've got to think that he, in Manchester at the time, he was like Manchester's Buster Rhymes. And so there was me and there was uh, my little brother, actually, who was also in the group. And I thought, okay, I need to teach myself how to rap. Um, so I was still quite green, to be honest. So it was kind of like, okay, I want to do hip hop. And, and so I'm in Dundee and I thought there's no other MCs. So I'm going to teach myself how to be an MC. And I kind of almost put my bass to one side for a while. And it was, it's kind of tricky because you're being a front man and you've got to write a load of lyrics and you've got to be like, you know, bold and confident. And so I was doing a lot of emceeing over hip hop tracks in clubs, guesting for bands. And that's how uh, the guys spotted me and uh, for Grand Theft Auto. So it was kind of like when I when I decided to become an MC, I, I decided what's the most coolest you know, OG name I could come up with. And uh, it was Robert De Niro. Actually, in the beginning, I was Robert De Niro, the man from Atlantis. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I cut it down to Robert De Niro. And so when when it came to the game, I was like, look, I want to, I don't want to be Johnny Wilson as I was playing bass in a rock band. I want to be Robert De Niro. And they were like, cool. Sounds like what we want to do. Sounds like our vibe. And um, as you saw in the article, I even signed my recording contract as Robert De Negro <laughs> because I thought like uh you know in my heart I really wanted to be a musician but but my brain uh said practically you know I mean that's the reason why I was going to university right that you know to get a quote unquote good job you need to get qualifications and stuff and I and I kind of had this dilemma I thought what if they don't like the the rap that I'm doing or this hard rock music, then I'll just blame Robert De Negro. And of course, in the 90s, we weren't using email. There are no smartphones. There's no social media. There's no Facebook. There's no YouTube. So you could literally lead a double life. And so Robert De Negro became a bit of an alter ego. Um, but as I've said to some of my students recently, and they're like, how do we know that you're really Robert De Negro? Because like, if you look on the, I think that the Grand Theft Auto wiki page, it's got some other random black guy's photograph, which I find kind of funny. But I showed him that, um, well, the real Robert De Negro has a Robert De Negro tattoo on his bicep. Mama give it to you with no trivia. to you with no trivia i bust heads like the feds with more alpha than better is it beta the heat seeker i got more bounce than a pair of new sneakers coming special like ed better yet just like a feature because i'm ripping on your mic just like i'm ripping through your speaker like a prophet to a preacher talking kind of like a teacher i'm full of grim tales so you can call me mr reaper yo i'm coming through with the freaky styling hot like the chili peppers cunning as wily coyotes so vote me the king of the area of the peace loving leader who's bound to take care of you sticks with a ninja coming through on the skins the man from atlantis slapping on his strings chilling with the funk flowing in chunks so she passes it let's go and gig it down More precision than decimal points, liminal joints, head, terminal velocity, plane eccentricity. Yeah, I'll be the N E G R O, Robert the Negro. Well, hella is where I'll go when I'm finito. What's right now is I deliver you rap with no trivia styles that I'm inferior, sing just like a period. I live.
of each day to strive above this tripe. Biggie lost his life. I'm sick of pointless bites. It ain't no one in mystery why Black Panthers physically suffer jail. But what prevails as media unveils shape resistant history. A bit of me, fiscal what and bigamy. So as a sociopath and skill, some I got the Wilson, Wayne Weedy Winky. That means you get dumb. Psychological, overset, diabolical, the lyrical, rhetorical, and also metaphorical. Blood some bad to one that's a fact you'll get smacked by the black cause of the skills you lack. It's the vital accessory, nobody can stand or get next to me. What blowing your mind like ecstasy? I can't be on as you listen to my song. It's the Harry T rapping it up all night long. But wait, it's a new flick. Don't be sick. I try to bust around to make your mind sick. Oh my God, I got the blues. When they get the happy, maybe pull away my boots. I kick the juice blues, you got nothing to lose. I'm not the way you swing is like a hanger from a noose. It's the chemistry of it. I got the flows when I want it. I'm sick of my Sonic and your style is ironic. It's cool to hear about uh, your upbringing in the Dundee music scene as well, because you've brought this up um, before about what a small, tight music scene it was there. A lot of people don't realise how Scottish the roots of Grand Theft Auto actually are. And um, in my conversation with Colin, he actually brought up how um, they used a couple of players from the local music shop um, to contribute on the score. And I wondered, is that the same music shop that you talk about being like basically the entire music scene of Dundee? Yeah, that was, to me, that was the centre of the city. Uh, at the time, I think it was called Sound Control, if I remember rightly. And then it, it yeah, changed. Yeah, that rings a bell from my last interview. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then it changed its name a bit later. Uh, but it was on, let me think, it was on Castle Street. So I, I have so much love for that, for that store because literally what happened is when I got dropped off by my dad into Halls of Residence on Castle Street, which was above, you got to think, it was above like some baker's shop. Uh, that would sell these like Scottish pies. If you've never had like a Wallace pie or a Bridie or or like you know corned beef and mashed potatoes, you're missing a trick. But I was above a pie shop and a coffee shop where they they sold ground coffee, so I could smell pies and coffee. And then a bit further down, I saw this music shop, and I thought, okay, let me just walk there. And uh, a bunch of amazing guitars. I've bought guitars from there. I've bought amps. And then in the basement um, was a a company um, that was doing um, like PA systems in terms of like set up audio system, sound engineers. And and so literally I hung out in that guitar shop when I wasn't at uni or when I should have been at uni, I was in the guitar shop playing guitars, begging them for discounts. And, and then I became a roadie and a sound engineer. And so literally you got to think my first real band was through that music store. One of my favorite basses was from that music store. Um, and like as a sound engineer, I got to roadie for, as I mentioned, Gun, Supergrass, Average White Band. Like I, I literally got to meet loads of bands and learn my craft um, and get paid to do that, right? You get to see gigs for free. That was part of the plan. So yeah, the scene was tight. And so what it meant was that a lot of the musicians were probably either working at the music store or would pop in regularly. And so a lot of business was 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 done there, right? If you need a vocalist, they're probably going to swing by that store. Um, and I, I haven't been to any of the places where it's been so focused on one store because, like, now I live in London. Of course, there's Denmark Street, which has got loads of guitar stores. If you've never been to Denmark Street, Google it like I did. Um, I, I interview there recently, and there's a place called Regent Sounds. And then if you look at the history, like, 
there was a recording studio in that guitar store where everyone's recorded there. I think it was Jimi Hendrix, Rolling Stones, Black Sabbath, Beatles, Bee Gees. And, and, and the vibe in that place, you could imagine that when you've got all those hit records recorded in that building, you just feel like 10 feet taller. But still, London's big, right? There's loads of stores. So no, Dundee was a kind of a cool place. You just got to think in that little that little street, there's pies, there's coffee, there's guitars, <laughs> there's songwriters. It was cool. Joyride, such a huge tune uh, for me as a child. As I've said, like I think I can honestly say, man, and I kind of wanted to ask what your opinion was on this. That pff, I don't don't think anything else got me into hip hop except for that. Like I'm a huge hip hop fan now, but back then that was like the only hip hop I was hearing in Grand Theft Auto. I mean, that's a cool that's a cool observation, and, and, and I guess. Well, obviously, there's like there's an age gap, but I'm thinking that in the '90s, what was cool, like um, coming from Manchester, there was the Manchester music scene. You know, Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, Oasis were about to come up. There's the Charlatans. Obviously, there was Joy Division a bit earlier. Uh, so Manchester was known uh, for its indie music, its guitar music, and and in some respects, I think our Manchester accent lends itself to indie music because we have quite a whiny accent. <laughs> so it's like wow you know now it's not until very recently that uh that you know who's there who's the rapper that's from manchester now that's lighting up everything h h i think look at the time when we were emceeing it wasn't really cool to have a manchester accent but h is like and i think wasn't he on a you know links advert uh doing some music he's made manchester sound cool as an MC, but prior to that you know, your voice was kind of lent to indie, but the music scene was like, there was, you know, dance music scene was big. There was 808 State. The club scene was big because there was the Hacienda, which is now some bougie apartments. But that was the club that anyone wanted to see probably in Europe. Um, and then you had those bands like, you know, breakbeat stuff like the Prodigy, Chemical Brothers. That's what I was going to say. That's mostly what I was aware of. Even at the age of seven, like my brother was majorly into the Prodigy and Chemical Brothers. And 1997, I've got to admit, like my dad was majorly into Radiohead and things like that. So that was the house I was brought up in. Which are cool. I mean, and if you look at the Prodigy, like I think there's one uh, like mixtape they did. I think it's called the Dirt Chambers or the Dirt Sessions, which came the out. The Dirt Chamber Sessions, so good. Yeah, that one is, so that is the blueprint you can see where the project got inspired and in that is some like you know ultra magnetic mc tim dog 
and it kind of so i i really love the prodigy because it kind of their playlist relates to the sort of stuff i was listening to so i think britain became good for like that da breakbeat dance music but we didn't really have the mcs like and the key to hip-hop is if you think about american hip-hop back then you know they didn't have to try so hard with the beats the beats could be a bit more monotonous and sparse because you had such dull mcs um and then also there was you know jungle became massive so i remember like you know one of my uh, he became a friend uh uk apache who had that song uh original nutter which is still a banger but i mean like you know so we had jungle mcs we had like rave mcs um but it's not until recently that now when you think about grime, grime and you think about those people that, that are hitting it up that i think the uk didn't really have a strong set of mcs or a music scene and so naturally then when it come, came to grand theft also and wanting to do dance music but wanting to do something because at the time globally hip hop was becoming a global phenomenon like we're now seeing that all those movies are coming out where people just think oh my god hip hop is cool it's beyond just you know the 80s where it was run dmc and my adidas like you know in the 80s you think about the street culture thing about tracksuits and trainers and baggy jeans and then in the 90s it's not just party music it's a social commentary and and there were some hard hitting lyrics and and so it fitted with Grand Theft Auto that we should have a radio station, which is hip hop, because we needed some hard lyrics to match the hard tunes and the movies that were out at that time. And, you know, I think if you think, I think Tarantino lended himself to, to guitar music, Quentin Tarantino with Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs and stuff. So they had that flavor, but also there were a lot of other movies that were using a lot of hip hop in their, in their soundtracks. And that's kind of the gap where they said, okay, we need to have that. And and so I think the hip hop that we were going for was yeah it was kind of in line with what the Chemical Brothers and the Prodigy were doing, like the the break the high end like high energy breakbeat, and then putting a, a vocalist on top. And I think you know a bit later in that decade it was probably the the Gorillas that got better at doing it because they actually in, if you look at the Gorillas first few albums what did they do they got American MCs, so it's amazing to think that you know that all of these things were kind of they were reference points that then got thrown into the game. You know, like I realized that the the popular popular culture and, and later on, like, you know, now that I've, you know, maybe, maybe you could say I've grown up, but, you know, like I've become a professor and I've like written a load of stuff on it, but I'm really into pop culture. And so what was cool was that, yeah, I'm from Manchester. Yeah, my dad's Scottish and my mom's Caribbean and they're from Dundee and Aberdeen and stuff. But it was the pop culture that really brought us together. It was our music our films and the things that we're seeing uh, that really resonated. And Grand Theft Auto was a reflection on the fact that, yeah, American culture was kind of cool. And so if you had a choice, like, you know, you either like, you know, coming from the UK, would a, uh, let's put it another way. Would a Scottish games company want to do something that's lock, stock, two smoking barrels or the Sweeney or stuff like that? And the answer would be no, because that's English. Yeah, and, and GTA London, to be honest, was a little bit of a flop. I yeah, think. but you can't. Yeah. We weren't going to do Tagger. I don't think the world was ready for like, you know, uh, a Grand Theft Auto, like or like Grand Theft Tagger or something. Where for those of you that remember, like the, my favorite thing is like how I don't think it translates because of his Glaswegian accent. But when he would say there's a murder, he said "Mother, there's a mother here." <laughs> <laughs> like, so um, American culture was understood globally, so they naturally reached for that. Uh, and and the streets and 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 the cops on the on the um, on the radio, like it all just fitted. Your word like you some kind of GTA assassin. Your word is bond. You ain't never gonna play me, son. I get open like sesame. You ain't never gonna test me. So please. So you think you are a good fella? Then fella, get the hell out of town. Cause I'm made and you're never gonna wrap out drums to get down. All your users, if you're bleeding, you're your water, don't fall to us. Cause you're hot on my face, you're playing that telekinesis. So please, put your back when I put the sack of flat. Come on, from the heathen with a big white teeth, yeah. Shit the shots as I'm bumping and hitting. Missing the goal of position in my position and dissing us because they know the listen. When I kiss them at the central nervous system, I throw the beano like Captain Nemo to my steel. Got to leave in the ground because I'm rubbing the Negro. 
you can fall with my lungs. I'll be stepping like man, so she be stepping on the GTA. Guess how far the formidable job is gonna blow your console. They literally just walked through a few pubs and thought, okay, could that fit in our soundtrack? And that was great. And, and if I remember rightly, like they said, look, Johnny, uh, we got big ideas for this game. And, and if we could afford them, we'd want the Prodigy or like, you know, Public Enemy. Like we, we'd want these uh, tracks, but we can't afford them. Like they wanted, you know, you imagine that, that, that video games weren't as powerful as they are now. So I think like a band like The Prodigy would like give me 150K or something like that for one of our tracks. And and so it's a bit like, to me, it's a bit like how hip hop used to be in the sense that when a, um, a rapper or a hip hop group would sample an old song, um, the amount of royalties would, would suffocate that artist because they were like, look, you know, uh, that guitar band or whatever it is feels that they're more powerful than hip hop. Whereas now the tables have turned and I'm sure that there are plenty of old artists begging rappers to sample their tracks so they can actually pay some bills. And so I think that that's also happened in the gaming industry where um, the powers change because you spoke about like why that was your kind of gateway into hip hop is because you're spending hours listening to that track and those tracks. And now the power of video games is that people are listening to those tracks again and again, and they're spending hours. And, and that's why there are plenty of bands that I know would be dying to appear in a game. And they, they probably pay. They probably pay to have their track on a game. Um, about 10, I think it was about 10 years ago, I remember trying to broker a deal that actually didn't, it didn't come off, but there was, a, there was a UFC game produced by Electronic Arts. It had real UFC fighters in it that were video captured. And so I knew the agent of one of the fighters. It was Hellboy Hansen. And and so I convinced the game to be able to like have rights to sponsorship of the art of the character in the game. So I was gonna like pay off my mortgage, sit on a beach, because I thought, let me tell these brands that if they um have their logos on the character's shorts or their gloves and stuff in the game, that's gotta be worth much more money and better value for money than, than than the adverts that they're doing on television and stuff because people are spending hours in front of their logos and people don't switch off because it makes the game seem real. The reality was at that stage, the brands that I went to, they just couldn't understand like gaming as being that powerful or they didn't have a line on their budget that said, and we, we advertise in games. So a lot of the ad agencies were like, well, we've got money for billboards and, you know, uh, contest us in a year, or could you prove the stats of effectiveness from previous clients? And of course, I didn't have those stats. And next year, the game is already out. Um, so I, I also think that, yeah, Grand Theft Auto has changed a lot from a business perspective. Like the fact that it's like, yeah, we can give people ultimate control over what a character does. We can have music, which is more than just three notes on a keyboard. Um, it's a load of stuff. And that's what's really cool about it. Smoking a blunt, licking a lump. Richie T, Richie T is one dog. Showing love. Showing love. Dancing in a club. Showing love. Showing love. Dancing in a club. Showing love. Showing love. Dancing in a club. Showing love. Dancing in a club. Showing love. Smack this, grab this. 
no need to practice. You got the assets, I'm doing the asking. Seen you in the club, pay me ten dollars. You made me wanna holler when you rubbed up my collar. Heard your name was Susie, table doesn't fool me. Short skirted cutie, I'm feeling kinda juicy. Go up that pole, slide down that pole, you got the soul. Turn my body loose control. Show it love. Show it love. Dancing in the club. Show it love. Show it love. Dancing in the club. Show it love. Show it love. Dancing in the club. Show it love. Show it love. Dancing in the club. Baby, shake your fan to your fan. The audio evolution that GTA brought to the table was massive. Mm. And video games were changing from, um, you know, being Mario largely children's entertainment to, to having a more adult e- edge. I remember having friends whose parents owned Grand Theft Auto and they kept it genuinely locked away. <laughs> um, so I, I really do feel like I felt this. And anyway, big long preamble to the question that's like, did you have any sense at the time rapping? This is really unusual to be saying fuck in a game. Uh, yeah, it was. Thanks for reminding me. It was like, oh, my, yeah, I did. I was thinking, yeah, I did. I did swear, didn't I? Um, some of them I, I I didn't. I think my natural thing was like, I'm recording now. It's like when you go on radio or TV, you don't swear. But yeah, you're right, because at the time, like the games, like apart from the obvious, like, you know, arcade games like Street Fighter and stuff where it's just got the same repetitive music. You know, I remember like people playing Tomb Raider or Doom. But often what what people would do would be like they'd they'd mute the audio and then you'd put on your favorite track that you want to shoot people to, right? Uh, Yeah, definitely. Put on a bit of Mob Deep, Shook Ones or something, and then just like, you know, reload, shoot. Uh, So Grand Theft Auto was different in that you didn't have to mute the audio. You were like, no, I I like the music and and it fits the mood. This is like like a movie game. Um, But I didn't think that the cultural significance would be massive. I didn't think that Robert De Negro would be a Twitter handle for loads of people. Um, yeah, I didn't. And I remember at the time when the game came out and it was like, you get all these news headlines, like it's going to get, uh, it's got banned in, I think, Brazil or something, and then it's getting banned. And, and that would just generate more sales. And the sales were going up. And I remember like listening to, had Radio 1 on at the time, and I remember hearing that, and I was like, oh my God, that's Grand Theft Auto. And then I came like, up, down, 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 speed. And I was like, that's me. Oh my God, I'm on Radio 1. And and there was just this tidal wave of stuff going on. And there was even there were even discussions of, would you be interested if we released it as a single? And and if it got released as a single, would you be okay with like, you know, you, your vocals are all over that track. So that would mean you'd have to perform it on television and stuff. And I was like, of course, (laughs) that was like, oh my God, this could be it. This is my break. You know, I don't have to buy a suit and a tie. Like I could, like Robert De Negro could like be my life. Um, There's part of me that still wishes, like imagine they had, imagine Robert De Negro was unleashed in such a way. (laughs) Quite frankly, I am surprised it didn't happen because as a kid and for a long time growing up until I started researching this stuff, I always naturally assumed the soundtrack to Grand Theft Auto was a load of um, genuine established artists from America that I didn't know yet and just hadn't happened to come across them. Um, So when I really got into video game music and started researching it and doing a podcast about it, it was... It was honestly amazing to me to find out it was just a handful of guys from Scotland, really. I know. And if you met them, they're the most nicest, unassuming, like, you know, broad accents. Like, you think about Craig Connor. Oh, my God. He's from Aberdeen. Like, his accent is so thick. I mean, look, 
I'm Scottish, so I, I can I can understand. I'm, I'm used to that. But to anyone else, you have to interview him. I don't know if his accent's changed. But, like, I remember what was, like, something he'd say. Like, if he was to say something like, I'll do that, it'd be like, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll do that. I was like, like, great, can I... <laughs> Can I have some more bass in my mic? He'll do that then. I was like, what? <laughs> my mates would laugh. They were like, because I think you know, when a Eric team time came to a recording when we were recording vocals, and um, I had to shout out Eric T, and I think he had trouble like, understanding him. He was like, that's Aberdeen <laughs> for you. And I have to shout out Eric T as well, because you know what? Um, I feel really lucky, because I actually remember saying to him, do you want to like, because I had so much respect for him as an MC, I was like, "Do you want to, do you want to like do some vocals on this track?" Because we're, and he was like, "No, this is your thing. You do it." So even and and even that was at the stage when he, I think he could see that this was going to be big for me, uh, because he'd been MCing for a lot longer and 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 he'd done shows. But I have to give him like respect because I don't think there are many people so humble that if someone said, "Do you want to get on on a video game?" Even if it's a minor success, they would have jumped at that chance. So yeah, I, I was really like looked after and supported. All right, how y'all doing out in the real world? Pure and simple. I tell you, I don't visit it much no mo. That's it. Into top my selector. I prefer my own little place on K R E Z. You know, this right here is the place to be. You heard me. You heard me, Richie T. I got my main man, Richie T. What's up, boy? What's up, son? Hey! Yeah, Yo, I got something to say. What you got to say, son? What you say, <laughs> boy? Yo, has anyone got one of them tracks that's like... <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 I know what you mean. <laughs> we are... 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 Yeah, yeah, I know you mean, boy. Yo, check this one out, son. This is Beirut. Questions for the Han Sensual Pages. Now that'll be the table. Deja vu forming all of my history Fiscally and visually It ain't no magical mystery tour All y'all done seen the law Fall from Judge Shred To being a folklore Poverty poor Seeping through my skin pores Making my conscious poor Unfit for heaven's door More stale I lost my halo Next and hell no The slice was getting fatal It's eating me like cable Babel is like a fable Able to grave It seems like a table My navel reminded me Just where I'm really coming from More 106 one less of the essential expression gives way to meet your henchman tension is how you learn your lessons stress watch me drop it in your optic you know a rocket here in center stage and all the way to trotting watching tempers rocking pop and suck it rocket douglas bought the ruckus and so you need to stop it Four wheels down, car jacking in Hilltown. Hedge just want a crown, I know it ain't Charlestown, get town. What the deal, I hear the deal. Steel is real, a Whitfield should grab a shield. Pinch me, nah, son, it ain't a dream. I go crazy, and it's wicked like a stream. Double team, won't even touch my seat. Wainy, weeny, winky. Hey, yo, hey, yo. We are, we we are. Check it out, y'all. We are. Tremendous ear benders, death senders. Strike a chord in your heart like Leo Fenders. Guitar shine, give me some time and a time. Park a ride on a run, sick it's a ride. Get with the wicked and drive, strike you well. Like a leg before wicked, sick it anywhere. To give you savvy fare, then we don't cross from us. Word is bond, I can sit you like a suture on a seven arms and they gone. I fall like Joe River, since I'm shiver, it's final, it's deliver final. So I'm like an emerald boy, where's the short to weigh you down to the quick? So you know not to bite, not to pick. Oh, 
I wanted to ask about GTA 2 as well, which has another two ta- uh, two tracks. Yeah. And whether that, that was like a separate session, um, like they did specifically bring you in for GTA 2, I hope. Yeah, yeah, they did. So what happened was, like in Robert De Niro's timeline, like I finished uni, I graduated, and I got a job working in advertising. So I kind of started my career off and so I moved to London in 1998. And so when Craig gave me the call, he was like, we're going to do GTA 2. Are you up for doing some more stuff? And I was like, of course. And so I remember, like, <laughs> they had a bit more budget, right? So I got flown up from London to Dundee on this um, propeller plane. <laughs> Executive. <laughs> yeah, it was like on this tiny little propeller plane. I remember, like, like the, the, the air hostess, uh, offering like, would you care for a drink? Sir? I was like, oh, thank you very much. I, I felt like, oh, Robert De Negro is going places. Like, I'm getting on a plane. Would you care for a drink, Mister De Negro? Yes, basically. <laughs> and it was kind of like, it was like t- I told some of my colleagues, like, yeah, yeah, I'm taking time off work. Oh, going anywhere? I said, I'm going to Dundee. I'm just happening to record. <laughs> I mean, they didn't get it still, but yeah, I, w- I went up to Dundee, and uh, actually, the funny story is that. We had the title track uh, for GTA 2, which, um, so we wanted it to be like another banger, like like the first game. And so I wrote a lot of lyrics and it was like, kind of, you know, it was like Return of the GTA. And, and I thought the lyrics were, were slamming. But in the end, if you listen to the game, there are no lyrics, there are no vocals, sorry, apart from right at the end where it goes, GTA 2. Yeah. Right, and the reason for that is that oh my god, Craig sent the uh, back sent the backtrack to Rockstar Games for approval. I remember, like, I remember this because um, it kind of it burns a bit, right? So, like, the difference between going from game one to game two is that, like, okay, yeah, more success, but but probably less less power, right? Because in like GTA, it was a blank piece of paper. The title track, we just we, we knocked it out, and and we maybe we got lucky, but I think there's something really special. The second track, they want to like hear the draft, so Craig sent them the draft track to get approval, and they and it was approved, and so he gave me the beat and said, okay, now write the lyrics and everything, and then we recorded it, and then I heard that some executive somewhere, whatever, do they know? Uh, some some different people from Rockstar Games uh, preferred the track without my vocals on it. The fools, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So so all that was left in was GTA Two at the end, and I didn't know this. So I remember like being in London and telling my mates, "Yeah, I'm doing the title track," and everyone's like, "Oh man, I can't wait to hear it!" And good good on you. And then I saw the TV adverts, and I was like, "Oh my god, it it's the game!" And then. <laughs> I don't hear any vocals other than GTA 2. <laughs> and it was so embarrassing because my mates were like, oh, t- top one, Johnny. N- nice vocal. That's, you really had them with those lyrics. How, how many bars is that that you rap for? I was like, shut up, man. But <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, that was another lesson about the music industry. Like, like just because you record vocals doesn't mean that they're going to get released.
I really enjoy how this conversation has gone, like just totally off the cuff and casual. It's been uh, perfect. But as a result, we haven't actually like chatted that much about the process of working with them. Um, I think you work with Craig mostly. Right? Yeah. So like, um, was it similar for both games? Like how did it go down between the two of you? So with the title track, Craig had a really strong vision and obviously we never worked together. So he was pretty much like, okay, here's the beat. The beat was pretty much finished. It was finished. And, uh, and then he said, and, and here are some lyrics that I've written. And, and then he would like, and, and if you're not a musician and you've never seen rap lyrics before, then it, sometimes it's not immediately apparent where you're supposed to put the rhythm. Like you can have lines, but there's sort of different, there are different ways that you can flow them and you can different ways that you can ride the beat. So I remember like Craig, like being all kind of apologetic, saying like, I'm, I'm not a rapper. And then he, hmm. <laughs> he was trying to rap his licks in his head. Like think of the rapper at the time. In his head, I think he thought he was Ice Cube or something. You know? like, Ice Cube with an Aberdeen accent. Yeah, Paul Ping. Like, you know, it was like, <laughs> and so, apart from giggling a bit, I'm like, listen, oh, okay, okay. I think, okay, I get the rhythm, and, and I've got the lyrics here, and and so I um, I worked them, practiced them. We changed a couple of lines or words where it was like look man i don't think the rhythm is working and he could hear it too because i mean he's a good musician so it was pretty much you know his vision and then my delivery and so what i had to do was i had to pick a voice and and that sounds i might sound a bit strange but like you know i mentioned before that i was kind of still quite new in learning my craft as, a, as an mc so i was still thinking like what is my voice like how do i sound like you know um I was a lot more flexible. And when I heard the beat, I was like, yeah, in my head, I was like, this sounds like Chuck D, Public Enemy. So I, I was trying to aim for that kind of tone and, and, and that rhythm. And, and, that, and that, that's what we did. And I think it clicked really well. We knocked that one out really quickly, very few takes. And then afterwards, he was like, okay, well, I got some other beats. What do you want to have a look at? And then, and then we sat through and we went through some different beats. And we, you know, I remember like, having basically I'd, I'd earned some brownie points so i could i could tweak i'd say like i think you should do this or this should be a bit dirtier and stuff but but then all the other lyrics for all the other games uh were mine that i wrote and delivered them in a way that i wanted and craig was like you know you're the mc just deliver them how you want with the exception of course of gta 2 where craig wrote gta 2 <laughs> So <laughs> that wasn't my idea, but right. if you, yeah, I don't know if the recordings exist. But I'd love to know because I, God only knows what I said. But yeah, everything else that those were my lyrics and, and my delivery. How and and I wanted to kind of in each game show a different style of emceeing. Uh, so if, if you listen to each of the tracks, I've tried to do something a little bit different in terms of the the style of lyrics and the style of delivery. So some are a bit more energetic and some are a bit more laid back exactly i mean like to jump back to gta1 you've got this huge contrast between blow your console which is this really fast all out uh, piece yeah uh, next to this life which is probably the the most relaxed of them all and as i i think i said before we got started a personal favorite of mine and i think it is with the general fandom as well yeah i mean actually when i think craig yeah, actually, I think the some of the chorus is, is uh, are lyrics that he wrote because I remember he had this beat, and then he was like he was like humming this melody, hmm, 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 hmm. and that was in his head, and all he had was like I don't have much in this life, and then I was like okay, right, so I think that, that that was his only request. I want that melody, and I don't have much in this life. <laughs> I was like okay, but anything else, go ahead. So I was like okay, right. And, and that's when I started talking about, uh, I don't know, losing your head with cess and stuff like that and stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, it's kind of funny because you say it was so long ago and um, obviously we're having this conversation now. About three, maybe four years ago, I used to do these little YouTube streams because um, I've said to you, uh, I'm a bass player as well as you, both yeah. bass players. I used to do these little YouTube streams where I would play uh, the bass lines to video game music specifically, you know, from all years, all types of stuff. And um, I've done this life. but Well, in fact, I've done Joyride as well. But yeah, it's just kind of strange that it comes full circle like this and, and that 
you guys surely never thought that it would come to that back in back in those days. Not at all. Not at all. Like so, you you have to share those things. I want to see them, but because listen, man, there wasn't even YouTube. Yeah, like like that idea. We weren't even able to Google stuff because Google didn't exist. Like it was just so much that wasn't around for for those early games. So literally, like when you learn your art as a musician, it was about going to record stores or, or or catching something on MTV and stuff like there wasn't 24 hour television that there were just, and I was stuck in Scotland. So, so there are those moments where it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to go to Manchester, visit my family. I'm going to go to a record store. And then it's like, can I, you know, you find secondhand records, you dig in the crates. Um, so I'm really proud that we just were able to understand the mood and, and the vibe of so many people, because now, you know, somebody can like post something on social media and say, hey, guys, what do you think of this beat? Let me know. Or you can like A-B test stuff and see how many people like this one over that one or different flows. Had none of that. I didn't even have other MCs to check with them to say, does this sound good? I was literally on my own with a couple of like albums trying to learn how to be a better MC and write lyrics. And there weren't like videos saying this is how you write lyrics and this is how you, like i'm i'm basically reaching for like you know thinking about what what did my school english teacher tell me about writing poems you know like about rhythms and alliteration and stuff that was what i was dealing with There's a hit alone, the shown to blow a dumb and prone. It's rock and body till it's gone. Smoke the weird of 40, lounge with shorty on the throne. Made like Al Capone. Score the black sense and stack it in the bones. Well known, it's blow brother silly stone. Lifted and gifted, that's how I live. Shift of mad bricks, spawn a bed. Bella to the floor, running as clocker. With nothing else to do, like was for Madonna. Went back to the streets to earn myself a dollar. Try to sell some trips to Nickerson and Fonda. I wouldn't touch that shit, leave me with my skunk. The only tracks I want is Hocker Bass, that's fun. If it's just a rock, it can take a jump. When I shoot one shot, it's a 22, you punk. I don't have much in this life. It's the sales that keeps me from losing my head in this world which we live in the strife. You got to give me one more chance just to settle my strength. Don't have much in this life. It's the sales that keeps me from losing my head in this world which we live in the strife. Nadia, that is a totally new yet authentic recording. Fantastic. How do you feel? Because there's, there's actually a range of opinions about this. So how do you feel about the whole thing that today in video games they don't rely so much on creativity. Well, specifically when it comes to Grand Theft Auto, they don't rely so much on a creative audio department like that and uh, just kind of licensing the most popular songs at the, uh, of the time. Yeah, I think it's a mistake. Maybe it might come full circle. I mean, what what do I know? But imagine that like, even from a positive marketing spin, you said, we want to like celebrate local talent and or unsigned artists from different areas. So submit your um, your music, and it could appear in the game. I think that could be huge. And if anyone's listening, then you know, you know, pay me for that idea, right? I mean, like I think, and the way I, the reason I think like that is because like now I'm a professor of branding at university, and I and I consult brands. So kind of I, I don't I'm not Robert the Negro anymore, really, um, just on my bicep, but. But that's advice that I would give to companies anyway. Like, imagine that you're in, like, Mumbai or something playing a game. 
if you had beats from a region, that would be so cool. And 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 I think that more games could do that. So yeah, I mean, so it could always become the Grand Theft Auto model of game development, where you you are you know a certain uh, proportion of your music is coming from local talent, and it almost becomes like almost like a CSR thing, corporate social responsibility. It's like no, we you know we are we are conscious and, and we we appreciate our audience, and it'd be cheaper. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think something like that is is a really really interesting idea and. I do think there's something to be said that I am a big fan of every GTA. I do love GTA Five, um, and I've played it to death. But I would struggle to tell you some of the artists that are listed. Well, pretty much any of the artists that are listed on the various radio stations. Mm. But um, I still, to this day, listen to the GTA One and Two soundtracks in full all the time. And I know my brothers both got them on USB sticks specifically for when he's driving. Yeah, as well. So, oh man. Okay, so then your mission, should you choose to accept it, is that this podcast has to make it to Rockstar Games. They have to bring back the Negro. I have to do some more vocals, and they should put me in charge of a department which looks for local talent and send me around the world to Mumbai, to Milan, to all these places, and and collect the beats that I know are going to make people's head nod. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Denegro rocking the rocking the people from here to Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about, though, really, isn't it, man? Getting to the foreign shores, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time today, so um, I'll just try and slip in one more question if you think I've got time for it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Well, we've talked uh, all about the music, but um, it has been documented that you've done little bits of voice work, like uh, for the police. Um, I think you said. Uh, Wasted and busted. Yeah, um, I've got to ask quickly before I continue. Did you do? Ki- did you say kill frenzy? I can't remember because it's just that was a big quote for me when I was a kid. Um, I can't like because I had like you got to think when you're doing the voiceover bits that they're, they're like little sound waves that go into the game. So I remember like having like a shopping list of things that I have to say. Of course, the one that everyone remembers is. Busted. Yeah. I, it was like, okay, can you go like say it again and go like busted? Like, you know, I said busted a lot of different times, like pick your <laughs> favorite wave file. And then there was like I also when I remember we have a we have a something like a 615 on East Hack and Slash. Yes. It's like we have a 615 on East Hack and Slash. <laughs> and I think I remember having to do the <laughs> it's not just that you did voiceovers, that you're like one of those special effects artists you know right that's really really interesting and and, and I, I i can't tell you how surreal it is uh to hear that i had a similar thing with uh colin actually doing certain things from the game but honestly that first grand theft auto was completely formative for me and i put hours into it and it opened my eyes on so many things including music so yeah it might accidentally make your children a music geek there's nothing yeah. wrong with that of course um, but yeah, man, we'll, we'll probably have to catch up at some point because uh, we didn't even get talking about bass playing much or anything like that. I know, but I enjoy. I enjoyed this. Absolutely, man! It's been incredible. Wow. Thanks for like bringing about the memories because these are like things that you just don't think about because it was so long. It's not like I I sit at home remembering those days, but but then just the fact that they just came back so easily. I suppose mean something as to like, you know, yeah, I'd underestimate how much it, it meant doing those things. And and it's fantastic to, to hear from you, man, because um, you kind of alluded to it earlier on with the, having the wrong picture on the Wikipedia and stuff. Yeah. That like, there's been a, a level of anonymity and the more I've researched, the more I've been confused as to who who is Robert De Negro? Who actually <laughs> even is he? And it wasn't until this article came out a month ago that I was like, there he is, that's him there. I know. I'm asking for an interview. So thank you for coming on. No, I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to listening to this. And then, you know, imagine gonna... I love the fact that we got to talk about so many musical references as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I say, like, uh, my listeners know I haven't even done this for a long, long time. So I am yeah. a bit rusty. And I've deliberately, you know, it's been a lot more casual, just two guys chatting. And I've enjoyed that. Yeah, that would be cool.